Hey, I am back. My sister asked me to give my opinion on Equally Yoked. She didn't say anything. She was just like, can I give my opinion on Equally Yoked? So what I'm going to say is I'm going to give my little two cents, just whatever comes to the top of my brain. And then I also want my brothers and my sisters to give your two cents because I have a lot of brothers and sisters who watch me. Some of my brothers and sisters, some of you all are married and you comment from time to time. So I want you guys to chime in too, right? Um, and I don't know. I know, I think the sister's dealing with something or whatever. So she's just looking for information um, for whatever situation that she's um, dealing with. But uh, hold on a second. Okay, I got a message come up. I'll call back. And so what do I want to say you know, the Bible says two cannot walk together except they be in agreement. And the Bible also says now, if you are if you marry an unbeliever, then you shouldn't divorce them just because they are an unbeliever. So now you got to work that thing out, right? And so therefore, being cognizant of the word of God and me being a single woman who's never been married, like my sister, shout out to my sister. You said when folk ask you, you ain't married yet? Tell them you ain't married yet and you ain't never been divorced. <laughs> I ain't married yet. I ain't never been divorced and I ain't never been cheated on. Well, apart from when I was, I guess that don't count though. Maybe when I was just a, a little young and I, you know, you call yourself have puppy love and stuff like that. When um, I remember this guy, a family friend, he was well known by the family and, you know, my mama, we was all, everybody was always together. Um, They would visit each other and he was such a little handsome little thing. I think I was like, I don't know. I know I was a small teenager and, and he was like, you my girlfriend. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Cause he was so cute. And so we would just see each other when we would go and visit over there. And then he would call the house sometimes and my mom would let me talk to him. So, you know, you have your little crush and stuff like that. And he was such a handsome thing. And what broke that up is, cause that's all we pretty much used to do. We would see each other from time to time. And I remember a few times he would kiss me on my cheek and my mom was, when we were leaving, my mom would say, all right now. <laughs> Um, but it wasn't nothing, nothing other than that. It was just, we were so young, but he would call the house sometimes and, and we would talk. And I remember we were visiting another, uh, family friend, my, my grandmother's friend, granddaughter, and she was younger than me. And so we were over there visiting, um, um, them and she and I were talking and I said, you got a boyfriend yet? Cause she was smaller than me. I said, you got a boyfriend? And she said, yeah, girl. And I was like, really? Cause I was surprised cause she was younger than me. And she was like, yeah. And I was like, who is he? And she said his name. And that was supposed to be my boyfriend, the same one that was calling me on the phone. And when she said that, my little heart sunk. And after that, it was a cutoff. You know, I felt real sad. <laughs> and so I remember when uh, when I was in high school, people would laugh at me because I would... um. And this is so off the subject of giving my opinion on it, but I'm going to just share it anyway. But people would laugh at me because I remember in high school, see, they would pick at me because I had weird, according to them, my boyfriends were weird. But, you know, I like to hang out with people who just make me laugh and we have fun. And I think my first boyfriend in high school was this Mexican guy. And uh, everybody would start whispering, oh, y'all, she used to bring your talker to that Mexican and he would pick me up and we would go on and let me go. We'd go bowling sometimes and I'd be with him and his family. Just innocent kids, nothing. You know, you know how you have your little crushes. And then the next boyfriend I had, uh, he left. All of a sudden, one year, he just didn't show up. I think their family moved a lot. You know, some of y'all folk move a lot. And um, and so that was the end of that. Then the next boyfriend, I, was, uh, I used to take like martial arts and stuff like that. And this guy, he was a senior. He was an upperclassman. He was also one of the instructors. And so we became friends and, and he would pick me up sometimes. And uh, he was a white guy. Then people would whisper about that. Oh, Sabrina, talk to that white boy. You know, they would be gossiping around the school and stuff. They would be laughing. I laughed too. Oh, well. But we had fun together. Um, you know, he, we would, he liked a lot of my music and stuff like that. I remember we used to listen to a lot of juvenile in high school. Baby, give me the keys, give me the weeds, give me the G's, give me the Mac 10s. Let me see what's happening. Them old days, we'd just be riding in his truck, right? And so he was more, there was more like just seriously a boyfriend, a friend that you hang out with. And that's all we used to do, hang out together. And we took martial arts and stuff together. He would help me l remember my patterns and stuff like that. But it wasn't, never no sexual stuff.
Mm. So anyway, how did I get on talk about that? But anyway, my sister asked me to speak on um, being equally yoked. And my thing is, it's spiritual. And like I said, I want all of you who are, you know, if you got something to say, comment, um, just to, you know, give her your advice and your two cents. But my thing is, um, when it comes to being equally yoked, we can't even, you can't have friends who are not even going in the same direction as you're going in, right? You know, because just think about it. As we grow in Christ, some of the places that we used to go, the things that we used to do, the people that we used to hang out with, we don't hang out with those people no more. Not because we think that we're better than nobody, but just because you're you're just growing in Christ. You know, you're just growing in the Lord. And then when it comes to looking at relationships, like I've never been married before, but I think one thing that has helped me preserve myself apart from, um, going through the hurt of my father being the really the first man to really ever break my heart. Um, but one thing that really helped me preserve myself too is really um, just studying the word of God and looking out for as you grow in Christ. Like I talked to my sister the other day and she was telling me something. She and her husband, you know, they live um, upstate and she was saying she, you know, she's happily married. And she said, you know, um, marriage has its ups and downs. She said, but when you are, you know, sometimes just when you need somebody to pray for you and you have a, a man of God that sometimes you don't even have to say that where they could just lay hands on you and pray for you, you know, and cover you um, spiritually, especially because she's very spiritually gifted, you know. And so uh, having somebody that can recognize you in the spirit and cover you, not, not, a, not, not, uh, I think spiritual protection is more, is greater than physical protection, right? Because life is truly spiritual. And look at all the battles and things that we fight. Look at people that watch you and observe you and will come against you spiritually that you don't even know. And sometimes you go through battles and sometimes you just have heavy days. You don't want somebody that don't know the word of God or somebody that you always have to pour into. Or you always have to, they look for you to do the work. I remember one time I went on a date with this guy. And he said, God told me you can be my wife. I was like, no, he did. Stop saying that. And he was like, yes, he did. He's like, you're going to be my wife. He texted me that too. But I already knew he wasn't my husband. I just, you know, it was just something that he needed to come across my path for. You know, he was about to make a bad business move, bad deal. And I stopped him and gave him my two cents. And then ever since then, he was, he wanted to keep in contact and go on dates and stuff. But after the third date, I was like, I can't do this no more. It used to feel so draining um because he would want me to just like the first date he just want to talk he, he like he just want me to talk talk and I would talk and you know he he would just sit there and he it was like nothing he just wasn't there was nothing to come out for me he was like I never heard a woman you know he was like I never dated a woman that thought like you thought or say the things you say he was like I like listening to you I was like okay I was like so what do you got it for me like you ain't got nothing for me <laughs> He didn't have nothing, you know, and when I talk about the word of God, it was like a void. He didn't have nothing, you know, it's not like he was a evil person, but he just didn't have nothing. And there was, you know, the conversations would just be me talking and then I didn't receive anything, you know, and most women, and I think I can, I think most of my sisters would agree with me, we you need feedback. You want to learn, you know, you want, um, based on what you say, you want to know that you, um, uh, for one, you're on one accord. Like, what do you think about what you, I've said? What are you, what are your ideas or based on what I've said? It's not just like, Oh, okay. I hear you. I'm gonna do that. Okay. I hear you. I'm gonna do that. You know? Um, but it's like, you know, and, and I don't want to say too much about that. Um, but everybody's just not on the same wavelength you get what I'm saying and then it was another guy that I was dating I'm just giving examples because I don't really have all the words other than what I've already said me looking at being equally yoked is from a spiritual uh perspective according to the word of God and so um there's another guy that he and I was friends for a while we talked on the phone uh, while he was always busy and because um, he, you know, he was very successful. He, he was in logistics. He ran a lot of, uh, he, you know, ran a warehouse and did, had a lot of business stuff going on. 
um, but he never really took time for anything. He was always at his warehouse, always shipping stuff, always doing this. And so that time with me, I was on the police force. I was a nursing assistant and I was a mental health specialist. So I was working three jobs and I was playing on two different tennis teams because I love tennis. So I always was busy, you know, like, and this has just always been my life. Like I always kept myself occupied because I always figured, well, I ain't got no job. I ain't got no, I mean, I'm, I don't have no kids, you know, and um, I don't really have a family. So I could just, you know, do everything um, I desire to do, just keep my schedule busy. And that was before I started keeping the Sabbath and stuff like that. Right. So sometimes I would work seven days a week. I would always have something to do. Most of my tennis matches would be on Sundays and stuff. Um, but this one brother, I actually was working in a, like where my house was, he lived in the same, he and I had a house in the same city. He didn't live near me. Right. Like I never knew where he lived. We always used to just, we, we, um, um, I think we met somewhere at a gas station or something or somewhere. I forgot where we met at, but we met and then we kept in contact. He kept calling over the phone and, um, he never took me on a date. We never, we never went on a date. It was always, he, he all, every day he would call me every day. He would call or text and, you know, if I, if I didn't pick up, I would text back in between. Cause you know, like if I was busy doing something at work or something, but he would call me about every day for about a year or so. We would laugh, we would crack jokes and stuff. And so I just, you know, it wasn't, I didn't see nothing as a good phone buddy. And then, um, you know, sometimes I would want to talk about the word of God or sometimes when I would have a hard day. It was, he just always was so jokey, which I, I like the jokey part, but sometimes I would have a, a a spiritual day and the things that I would go through sometimes he, I didn't, he, you know, it, he, I, I didn't have that type of, that, that type of connection with him where he could, um, how can I say it? How can I explain it? Where if I was going through something spiritual he wasn't available. Like not saying that he can't pick up the phone, but it was just like, okay, let me go. Like if I be like, you know what? I'm dealing with all of this, you know, spiritual warfare. This is happening. You know, I'm dealing with uh, sabotage. I got somebody that's got envious eyes on me trying to make, trying to cause problems for me in the workplace and stuff like that. It's like, he didn't really have no comforting words to give back based on the word of God, you know, because the word of God will help encourage you through situations that you go through. The Bible says faith come by hearing, hearing the word of God. And that really wasn't in him a lot, you know, and he was still, um, you know, he was just into stuff like, he, like the, the, the way his mindset was into the, the, some of the things of the world. Like it just, you know, we didn't always click spiritually, just, just to make a long story short, spiritually, we just weren't there. You know, but like sometimes when it comes to laughing and talking and, and him sharing how business went and stuff like that, that will be good. You know, I, I'd listen to him on that and, and give advice, but it was like he was just in this little place of his own because he also was a millionaire. And so I found it to be, for some reason, to, for my point, men who are, are very financially wealthy, um, in my opinion, only the ones I've come in contact with, right? They seem to be more in love with their money. And there's a bit of selfishness there. Like, it's like he didn't know how to see outside of him. Like, sometimes I would talk about me or try to explain something, and he would always flip back to his situation. And I don't think he was really cognizant of that because sometimes we're not really aware of ourselves. But when you try to talk to him, you'd be like, oh, do you ain't nobody got time for this. Don't start that, blah, blah, blah. And so it was just like, all right, bye, you know? Um, and so spiritually, he didn't have any room in his heart, in his in his mind for Christ. But I wasn't going to, I'm not going to say he's he was an evil guy. He just was in his own little world. He made a lot of money. And sometimes men who make a lot of money, um, some men, I can't speak for all, but some of the few that I've come in contact with, it's like they feel like when they show what they got and what they do and how much they make, that's an easy catch for women. But all women are not impressed by your money, you know. Um, some women look for more. 
And so after about a year or so, just talking and stuff on the phone, sometimes I tell him, I'm like, okay, because sometimes he's like, you know, you're my girl. I'm like, no, I'm not your girl. Like, you never took me on a date. He was like, oh, you know, you could come by the warehouse um, anytime or whatever. I was like, I'm not coming by no warehouse. You know, you, 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 we have to, you meet me and we go some, we sit down someplace. I'm not coming to your warehouse, you know, but I was also very busy as well. So it wasn't a lot of pressure there, but at the same time, we never spent that one-on-one -on -one time together until, um, at, like I said, after about a year went by, I realized that this wasn't, you know, a husband. I kind of realized that before then, but at the same time, I wasn't really putting him in that category. I just was like, you know, just learning him as a friend and spiritually, we just weren't the same, you know? Um, and then, so we lost, not really lost contact. I kind of got away from spending so much time on the phone and I was, you know, indulging other things in my life. I think I, at one point, I think I picked up more um, activities. I had a, a partner that I would play um, enter tennis tournaments with and stuff like that. And so he and I would enter tennis tournaments and stuff together. And I just wasn't really on the phone and stuff with this guy anymore. So we hadn't talked in months and then a couple of months went by and I get this call and he says, Oh babe, I need you to come and get me. You know, I'm in a hospital. I was like, hospital. And he was like, yeah, he's like, I, I got, uh, I had a lot of pain. I was having pains in my body and, um, it was so bad. He, he said, he told me that I had lupus. He said, the doctor said that only 1% of the men in the world had this, you know? And, um, and he said at some point, I think he said the pain was so bad, he took some pills. He took a lot of pills. He was trying to kill himself. And so they won't discharge him unless he have a family member or somebody there. Now, his mother is also um, a medical doctor, and he did a lot for his family. And he said that his mama was just telling him just stay in the hospital for a few more days or whatever. And his family, they would just tell him just go by a doctor's orders. Like they kind of just pushed him to the side. And one thing I noticed, no, no, knew about him is he loved his family he always went out of the way for them my niece gonna gonna have this he had his dream house built you know he's like my niece got a key to my house my mama got a key to my house my my brother got a key to my house you know and um you know he just built up his life he's like my wife gonna do this and and my wife gonna be just like my brother wife he used to say these type of things on the phone and stuff so he already had his mind made up but what I realized is he was self-absorbed. He was very selfish. My wife going to do this. My wife going to do that. Because my brother wife, um, she, do, she does this for him. She be cooking and she don't give him no problem. So it was almost like he was telling me these things. Like he's programming me to how I'm going to be. And my wife, she going she gonna to stay at home and she ain't going to do, you know, she going she gonna to stay there if she want to go somewhere. Like it was just an authoritative thing. And I was like, I was just listening. Mm. You know? And so, um, but like I said, we had lost connection over after some months. Then, um, um, he, when he was in the hospital, he said that he needed, he wanted me to come and get him. I was like, you, you're in the hospital because you want to hurt yourself. He's like, yeah. He's like, but you know me. He said, man, when I was having all that pain, he was like, I just kept taking pills. Really? He said, I ain't really, um, was trying to really killed myself he's like I just kept taking all them pills because the pain wasn't going away or whatever you know and he said they had to pump my stomach and get them out um he said but it's like the pain he said like I never felt before he and I said well I used to tell you you need to take a break you know you stay there and you just constantly work 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 you know and I said but you know God is a healer I said when I used to talk about the Bible you act like you never really want to hear I said but God is a healer I, it don't matter what you know science says I said you know if you trust God and you take care of yourself, get to the gym, start exercising more. I said, you can probably beat this, you know? And, um, and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I prayed about if I should go and get him and it was in my spirit to go and get him. And so I had an apartment outside of my city and I drove down to get him about an hour and a half drive. And I told him before I came, I said, I'm gonna let you know. I said, when you come, I said, you're not sleeping in my bed. You can sleep on the couch in a recliner. I said, but you're not sleeping in my bed. And um, he was like, yeah, yeah, you know, you ain't got to worry about none of that. He's like, I got a lot of respect for you. No, I ain't never disrespect you before. I said, I'm just letting you know because you also ain't never been under the same roof with me before either. And um, and so I went and I got him and came back to my apartment. And I have, I always keep my oil, anointing oil. And so I anointed him. I anointed his 
arms, his legs, it's down to his feet in the blood of Jesus. And we prayed and we prayed against the sickness, you know, we asked God to heal him. And, you know, he had tears coming from his face or whatever. Um, and that was that. We just sat up and talked and laughed that night. He cracked jokes. And then um, I had to go to work the next day. So I think I cooked that night so that there could be food there. Um, when I left or whatever, he wasn't disrespectful or anything. I could tell, I could feel he was at peace. And, and he told me, he said, you know, um, that next morning, he said, you know, since, ever since you uh, prayed for me, he said, I don't feel that pain. He said, I didn't feel that, that pain in my body. He said, it went away. And I said, well, it ain't me, it's God, right? And I could tell he was really observing me, but I didn't say much because he didn't know me up close and personal. We had never um, sat down and, and, and went out on a date. We had never, um, you know, really sat down across from each other. We were just always on the phone. And when he would really get annoyed, sometimes I would just hang up the phone, you know, so he knew my voice. He, he, he knew what, what I was involved in, but he never really spent time around me to really feel the type of person I was, uh, up close and personal. And so after a few days, I, I, um, I think it was a, a two 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 days or so after that I was off and he needed to go he wanted me to take him to go and send his niece some money everybody started calling him for money then and that was really that was a kind of a red flag to me because when you were in the hospital your family pretty much abandoned you that's why you called me who you hadn't spoke to in months you know and I was a friend to you even though we hadn't spoken I was a friend to you when your family told you they kind of just left you just go out what the doctor said you know, just stay there. They didn't believe in you. They didn't try to speak life in you. And this same family that you always bragging on giving yourself to, now they knew you were in the hospital. You were sick. You were going through something very painful, got a bad diagnosis, and now you're feeling a little better. I'm off. And what you want to do is have me run you. I didn't tell him this, but this is what's going through my mind. You're having me run you around um, to send them money. He had to send his niece money. Then his mama called. She wanted him to go pay her cell phone and, and for a woman to call her son like that um, when he's with another woman, even though we weren't in relationship, to do something like that, that's just her pulling, her, showing her her strength, or her power, or her control still over her son. But what I saw it as, I saw it as a lack of love. I saw it as negligence. And in my mind, the whole time, what I'm feeling out and discerning, I am so glad that I will not be a part of, you know, um, this family. It just, this is not what I'm supposed to be a part of. I'm seeing how they treat him and he just going along with it. Cause he got it. He got the money, you know? And, and, and that's all he talked about. His family is like, he didn't even, he can't even see Not one time that he said, Hey, pull over. Let me put some fuel in this car. And I, and I never asked, I just wanted to observe how he operated, how he moved, you know? And like I said, talking over the phone, over the time that we used to talk, I knew where his mind was. He'd always talk about his family, his business. You know, he'd like to talk to me. Make, I make him laugh sometimes. He make me laugh. But it wasn't nothing where he got ever got my, into my heart, you know. Um, and so when it after he ran those errands that day, and when it was time for me to take him back, I think I took him back that Saturday or Sunday, that weekend, right? He just stayed just a few days. He didn't stay with me long, just enough to strengthen his spirit and strengthen his mind because what I knew of him, he likes to work and, you know, he's a professional person, but at the same time, you know, um, we, ain't, we ain't never had that type of connection. And so when I t went to go take him back on, he wanted to tell me that Sabrina, I know I play, uh, you know, I used to joke around a lot. I never you used to tell me, let's go sit down and have dates and stuff. And he said, I know I never really took the time to, to really, um, uh, date you like I should and stuff. He said, well, really, I was kind of nervous. You know, he said, you, you know, you can be a little intimidating. You a strong woman. He said, you know, I was a bit nervous about it. He said, but now I, I see more being around you. I see more how you are. And he was like, you know, um, I want you to be my wife. And my mom's thinking like, <laughs> I'm like, but, and so I'm just listening and trying to get you know, hurry up and get to that destination so I can drop him back off. And then I go my way because it wasn't that. I did what I needed to do as, and I think that's just God wanted him to build a relationship. He had to build his relationship with God for himself. I was never supposed to be his wife. He was never my husband, you know. And after some time went by, and he took something too. 
he took a battery because I had extra battery for my phone. He was like, oh, let me take this battery. He took he took it when we were leaving. I, and he said, let me take this battery because my battery's going dead or whatever. And um, and I was like, okay, that's fine. He took a battery for his phone until we got back to the city that I was dropping him off in. And so when he when it was time for him to get home, and I was just so ready for him to just go get in the house safely. He was like, but, you know, he's like, what you going to do? So he put pressure, you know, he tried to put that pressure. What you going to do, you know? I was like, I don't know, you know? I said, I, I did a good deed for you. I don't even, you know, I don't want to discuss that. That We just friends, you know? And um, and he was like, you you going to be my wife. And, and so he got out. And then later, I forgot that I, he had my battery So because I had came back to my house. He never knew where my home here was. He only came to my apartment that was out of state. And that was his first time. And so when I got back home, uh, I was like, I'll just stay at my house and I'll go back the next day. He's like, well, I want you. I would like you to come and stay in my house. He got this nice big old house. But I don't, you know, I don't do that. I never, um, my grandma and mom, everybody, we never believe in you know, no shacking up and stuff like that. And I was like, no, I ain't staying at your house now. You know, I said, it's nice though. But um, I came back, spent the night at my house and I realized my battery, he had it. So I called him and I was like, you got my battery? And he was like, yeah, I'm busy right now. He tried to act like he had an attitude. And I know the attitude was because I did not answer the question that he want me to answer the question the way he wanted it. And so he, and I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to leave tomorrow. I was like, so can I just meet you today before it get late? He's like, I'm, I'm out with my brother. I was like, okay. He's like, I was like, okay, so you're going to call me um, once you get back settled or whatever? Can I just meet y'all when y'all out somewhere? He was like, I'll get it to you. I'll get it to you. It's just a battery I can buy. He, you know, he was just acting real funny or whatever. I said, okay. And so I was, t- was talking to one of my other brothers because I didn't understand it. And so I called and talked. At that time, I had another friend um, who was um, a man of God, um, a young brother, but he was, you know, he was really into God. And so I was talking to him and I said, you know, um, after what I did for this guy, it's like he acting real funny with me about my battery. He was like, no, he was like, let me tell you something. You don't even need that battery. He said, um, the reason he acting like that with you is so he can, he keep, he, um, he could have gave it back to you. He probably intentionally kept it so he could have had, um, you know, saw you before you go back or whatever, or have you keep calling him for it. He said, what I want you to do, he said, after all you've done for him, he don't even have to act like that. He said, what I want you to do is tell him he can keep the battery. God got something better for you. <laughs> and you say, I'll buy you another battery if you did. <laughs> I was like, no, you ain't got to buy me no other battery. But he was like, that thing had me loving. He was like, just tell him he can keep the battery. God got something better for you, you know? And so when he finally did, like he didn't he didn't contact me none that night. That next morning, um, when I tried to call him to see if he was gonna give me the battery or whatever, uh, he was like, Where you wanna meet it? I was like, But I said, You can just keep the battery. God got something better for me. And after some time left, he didn't call me, then he finally called and he was like, Um, you you done made up your demise. Like he was just so stronghold demanded like you done made up giving me that ultimatum but you ain't really got nothing to offer me see what i'm saying you got a lot of money but that ain't what i want who want to get married to somebody with a lot of money and you there's nothing there's no substance you don't know nothing about me you know i like animals do you like animals could you ever see yourself building a farm living in a country you know like there's no substance we there's it's, everything is about you you got all the money. You got all the stuff. You got this, you know, and I, I have, I held my own, you know, I had my house and I also had an apartment out, out of town, you know, so I've always been independent, but spiritually the Christ bond ain't there. The minds don't match. We ain't like-minded. You put your family in every single thing and put them in everything. And when you got to your lowest point, they were not there for you. I came to be there for you and you still put them first it's like you're not cognizant but i t- i could you know and he told me after some time he's like well this we, we ain't got no friendship ain't no friendship if you ain't ready to go to the next level ain't no friendship and in my mind i'm thinking where's this guy mind at we ain't never spent a lot of time around each other just that phone conversation and stuff and now you want to marry me and you get mad you know and so but if I'm missing something, my married folk, I want y'all to comment too. If I'm missing something, y'all comment. You know, your country bunk is still learning. But spiritually, we weren't equally yoked, you know. So it didn't matter about the money because he had it, you know. <clears throat> he had enough to cover him and me. 
Um, and so that wasn't it. Spiritually, people, we deserve to be happy. We deserve to be fulfilled. We deserve to be listened to. If I'm talking and you listen, you, you need to be able to respond to what I'm saying to show me that you were listening and you heard me. If you're talking and I'm listening, you know, um, so there needs to be understanding, equal understanding, you know, compassion, love, loyalty, and honesty. There needs to be a bit of vulnerability, equally yoked. If you're being vulnerable, he needs to be vulnerable. You know, sometimes um, my brothers can comment, a lot of men, and I've had my big brothers tell me this, men have a thing about pride, and I've seen it on my own eyes, you know. Um, even sometimes you can help. I've helped a brother fix something on his truck. And he act like I had nothing to do with it. Like he did it himself. And I was like, that was like dishonoring me, you know? So I'm like, I never would help him again. It's the pride thing. Um, I don't know what it is about that, but it's just, it is what it is. But so my thing is being equally yoked spiritually and also certain characteristics. And we all got things that we still need to learn from. None of us is perfect, but uh, like my brother said in the other day, when I shared in that video, men and women need to have sincere conversations. Like my brother said, um, that same brother, he said, no, he said he can't speak for every man, right? But he can speak for generalizations of things. No man's mind work the same. Everybody's situation and circumstance is different. And just like me, I can't speak for every woman. I can speak for maybe generalizations of things. Everybody's situation and circumstance is different. But when you come together and you sit and talk, if the spirits don't connect. Don't be anxious to just get involved in something, you know, and especially don't let the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh lead you. Don't be anxious to just get a ring on your finger. Take your time and make sure your, you, your spirit is being nurtured and you feel that security and you get that confirmation from God. And if you really in God, make sure that they're in God so that they help you grow up and not pull you back down, you know? So, that's just my little two cents. Um, you know, that's just my little two cents. So I would love to also hear um, what everyone else has to say as well. Right. This is my opinion. Right. So I hope that helps you. And I hope what our other brothers and sisters say also help you. Right. Have a blessed day.